and uh, grab a copy of God's Word and uh, turn to Luke chapter 12. There's plenty of Bibles around, and uh, let's make sure that this time together is valuable, profitable, and uh, so grab a copy of the Bible and uh, turn to Luke chapter 12. And while you're doing that, I'll just say we're going to be talking about Jesus tonight. That's kind of what we do around here. Uh, I don't know about any other church you may have gone to or what you go to now. Uh, They may talk about a lot of different things. We're kind of limited around here, and I'm happily limited, happily closed-minded. We just talk a lot about Jesus. If it's Jesus' church, I just figure that's what we should be doing, talking about Jesus, talking to Jesus, praying to Jesus, singing to Jesus, and then getting quiet before Jesus. Maybe Jesus will talk to you, right? It's all about Jesus. As a matter of fact, he told all the people in the temple, the the religious folks, you're looking in the Bible, looking for eternal life, and all the while, it all points to me. So if he says that, i got to figure that's what we should do right here. So we've been doing that uh, for like the last eight months. We've been just going through the Gospel of Luke, and we're trying to figure out what in the world Jesus actually said, and what he said about himself, and what he said about you, and what he actually taught, and what he actually did, and what he said he's going to do. That's a big one, right? And so we don't want to ask Grandma about that. We want to find out what he says. And so we've been studying through uh, the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to continue to do that here tonight. Tonight in our text here in in Luke chapter 12, uh, you're going to see that Jesus gives us some clear instruction uh, on proper worship, on how to, not not, not like where your hand, like anyone in here, hand held high people when they're they're in their worship, and there's some of you in here, right? And some of you are are, are kind of like your closet charismatic, so you go like this behind the pew, so like, I'm like, Lord, I want you to see me, but I don't want anyone else to, Right? I understood you went to Catholic church growing up, and it's okay. It's okay. I get that. I was in temple. You're not even allowed to talk. You get smacked. So, so, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about what songs you should be singing. And he's not talking about how, uh, how high the volume should be on the amp when we're worshiping. He's actually going to teach us how we're supposed to be living, right? And that's what worship is all about. We're going to be worshiping something. And, and worshiping doesn't always mean, you know, getting down and, and bowing it's just something. Worship can be easily, just as easily defined as what you so easily give your time and your, any of your resources to, just willingly and easily and freely and aggressively. I give it to this. And so we want to worship what's right and what's deserving of worship, and that's Jesus Christ. And so here in Luke uh, 12, look here in verse uh, 22, look what he says here. He's, he's going to teach us about, about what to, how to worship, right? He says, uh, he turns to his disciples and he says in verse 22, uh, that is why I tell you. Stop. Right? That is why I tell you. So you can see he's about to download into you something. Right? He looks at his, at his followers and he's trying to, he's going to download something into them to give them proper instruction on how to live. But he says, so that is why I tell you. So you have to wonder, what does he mean by that? What do you mean that is why? What, 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 what is that? What's the, what, what's, the, what's the that that he's talking about? Well, uh, if you look at the verse uh, before that, the reason why he says that is why, what he's referring back to is this thing that he was talking to his peeps about, about not acquiring a bunch of stuff to, your, to yourself here on earth and focusing on that, but, but to have a rich relationship with God. So, so here it is, like I, like I promised you, that he, he's going to teach us on how to live, how to worship him, right? And, and the reason he's about to teach us how is because of this. He wants to, you to have a rich relationship with God. And I don't know about you, but I want to be rich. Anybody in here want to be rich? I would just like to know what that even means. And I think that you're going to get it right now. Okay, we're not going to do a reverse offering. We're not going to hand you a bunch of money here tonight. There's going to be something different that Jesus has in mind. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to find out how to be rich, how to be rich. And I'm probably going to disappoint many of you because it has nothing to do with acquiring a bunch of money. So if that's what you were looking for, sorry, kind of. Verse 22, then Jesus turning to his disciples, he says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothing to wear. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or or store food in barns, for God feeds them. 
and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, I love that. It's that that little hint of condescending, you know? Like you can't even add a minute to your life? What's wrong with you people? I could do that like that if I really wanted to. What's wrong with you? I I just love that. That's just me. (laughs) And so uh, if you can't even accomplish a little thing like that with your worry, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They, they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat or what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Awesome. So Jesus says, you're going to pursue this rich relationship with God. Don't worry about all these everyday things like food and drink and clothing. These are your basic needs, right? What are your basic needs? What are they? Food, clothing, shelter. It's a holy one in every single group, man. I, God bless you. It's awesome, awesome. Extra heaven points right there, right there. Yeah. So there's some basic needs for the human life. You know, our, we have like two basic needs in human, in human life, in, 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 our, in our human race. And that's the, 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 the fight to survive and the fight to reproduce and carry on our genome. Like, that's it. That's what we, we're animals that, in that way. In that way. We just want to live. That's our fight. We live for these things. And, and Jesus is like, yeah, well, don't worry about those things. So, so, like, so when I read this, like, and this is probably just mostly for men, right? Where men are like black and white guys, right? And we're just like, okay, so, and my wife says that I'm shallow, and I don't, you know, whatever. <laughs> she says that I'm shallow, but, but, <laughs> I want to say things that I can't, right? Hi, Facebook. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, so. <laughs> But we're black and white people, right? So, so men are like, on the surface, we're like, oh, okay, so if I want to have a rich relationship, what you're telling me is if I just don't worry about those things, and, and I, what does that mean? Like, don't worry about it. Don't, don't think about it too much. Don't, don't work like crazy and try to accumulate a bunch of things. Just don't worry about it. Just wait on the Lord and just sit there. And if I do that, then, then I have a really rich relationship with God. Because we're, 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 we're basic beasts, men especially. I'm just picking on men because I'm not a woman. I don't know what it's like to think this way, the way y'all do, right? If I do, I'm writing a book. And, and, and so, I'm gonna be, then I'm going to be rich. Good night, right? That would have been it right there. So, so, so it, men, we think that way, right? We're, 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 we're black and white people. He said, if I don't worry about it, I'm good. Is that really all it is? Just do this and you'll have a rich relationship. Well, some might think that, but if you take a look at Scripture and you read it at all and you look at the whole picture of our relationship with God, you'll actually get the answer to that. And I would just tell you that it's a resounding no, that's not it. So let's just start at the beginning. When we start our relationship with God, um, let me back up a little bit. We all have a relationship with God. Everyone on earth has a relationship with God, except some of us have a really bad one. The Bible would say that we're, but before we're saved, that we're enemies of God, right? Enemies of God because of our sin. And that's not a good relationship. If you're like on the other side and God's fighting you, that's not a good relationship, right? So, so we're talking about a rich, good relationship. So, so, so how do you start that? Well, we get saved, right? That's what we get. We get saved. So we talk about that in church all the time. We get saved. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, well um, 
Uh, Ephesians 2a would say that God saved you, right? We have an eternal destiny because of our sin nature and our active willful rebellion against God because all of us do naughty things that we're not supposed to. Everybody, right? And, and everyone, don't look at the guy next to you, everyone, okay? And so, yeah, point him, <laughs> this guy, okay? And if you're real naughty, they make you an elder. And so <clears throat> what, what happened, yeah, <laughs> So listen, listen, I'm one, I'm guilty, it's all good. I'm not like throwing stones here, I'm whipping it at myself. I don't even know where I was anymore, but we're saved from, from our destiny in, in hell. And we're saved from the power of that sin that controls us. We don't have to say yes to it anymore, right? We don't have to, we have this new power inside of us, so we don't have to act naughty anymore, And all that happens, it says, according to the scriptures in Ephesians 2.8, that God did this. He saved you by his grace when you believed. And that you can't take credit for this, that it's a gift from God. Right? It's not something that you did. It's a gift from God. Salvation is from God. It's not something that you did. It doesn't matter. My mom is really good. She doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke. She's been with one man her whole life. Not good enough. It, hurt, it hurts me to say that because I love her. She's my mom, but that's not good enough because she has been naughty. Maybe it's not like our naughtiness that's out there, but she's broken rules. She's broken God's rules. She's rebelled against him at times, and so it's not good enough. But it's his grace. He saved us. It's a gift from him. Jonah 2.9, Jonah says that salvation is of the Lord. Yes. Psalm 62, seven, my salvation and my honor depend on God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ, not through you. Right. Romans five eighteen, Christ's one act of righteousness on the cross brings us a right relationship with God and new life. Romans 3.25, for God presented Jesus as the, can someone say singular? As the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life and shed his blood. Do you believe? Amen. Hebrews 10.10 says, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. uh, Psalm 3.8 Salvation belongs to the Lord. That's where it comes from. The old 1800s preacher, one of the most famous preachers of all time, awesome stuff, wish I could talk like he does. His name is Charles Spurgeon, and he said this about our salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. The Lord has to apply it to make the unwilling willing, to make the ungodly godly, and bring the vile rebel to the feet of Jesus, or else salvation will never be accomplished. Listen, this is it right here. Salvation is found solely in trusting Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross at Calvary on your behalf. And that's it. That's the gospel. You heard it. You have a chance to, to, to respond to that right now if you want. If you recognize the fact that you have fallen short of God's perfect standard and you realize that now someone told you Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay for your sin, you can be saved for all eternity right now. That's it. And you just got to tell him, I believe it and I receive it and I'm in. And that's it. You don't have to say any fancy prayers. You don't have to come up here and talk to me. You don't have to do anything except talk to him. You could do it right now. You could do it in the bathroom. You could do it in the lobby. You could do it in your car. It doesn't make any difference when you do it, but I beg you, do it. Because it's the only way. It's the only way. We have to trust in Jesus Christ. Have you you discovered... Has your mind woken up to the fact that you were not good enough and that Jesus Christ went to the cross for you? Is anybody in here trusting in Jesus Christ for their salvation? 
I mean, that's good. You should let, yeah, you can clap. It's like exciting. This is the greatest news ever. But you can't, like, think of something. There's something you absolutely could not do. It's absolutely physically impossible, and you don't have to fix it. He fixes it for you. That's the most, I don't know any other thing in the whole world that's like that. Everything else i got to try to figure out. I don't have to figure this out. He figured it out for me. It's awesome. I'm really not that smart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we, we start our relationships. See, we're talking about a rich relationship with God. We're talking about, do I just need to not worry? If I don't worry about this stuff and I don't let it consume me, about working so hard to gain my food and gain my water and gain my, my basic necessities. If I just don't do that, I have a rich relationship with God. Well, I say no. Because we, we realize that starting the relationship is based on trusting Jesus Christ. You have to trust that what he did on the cross is good enough for you, right? We have to trust that. So salvation is the start well, the continuation of this is what we would call sanctification. I don't want to get all bible on you, but let's just call it this. Growth and change. Growth and change. Anyone in here ever wonder what God's will was for your life? Raise your hand. Anybody? Most of you. The rest of you have never wondered that. It's amazing. <clears throat> if you raise your hand, you've come to the right place tonight. Because I'm going to tell you right now what that is. Here's God's will for your life. You ready? It's found in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That's it. That doesn't mean you're awful. It doesn't mean you're terrible. It doesn't mean you're disgusting. It just means that he loves you so much that he goes to the cross to save you, but he also loves you so much. I would just say this. He likes you so much, he doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He wants to change you and grow you. Right? Anyone have kids? Do you want them to be in kindergarten forever? You love them when they're in kindergarten, but don't you just want to see them grow? So it's the same thing with God our Father. He loves us when we were in kindergarten, but he also wants to see us grow into everything that we could be. And that's his plan for us. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, to grow, to mature, to change. But what does that mean? look like? What do you mean change? Change to what? What do you want me to grow into? What, are, what am I supposed to be? Romans 8 29 says that it's God's will that all of us should become like his son. So, so when he says I want you to grow and change and mature, I want you to become like Jesus. Does that mean you're supposed to put on a robe and put on some sliders and grow your hair long? Like that's not going to work for me. It, there, there's a problem if that's what it takes to be like Jesus, to, to, to grow like, you've seen the pictures, you've been to Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about, I got a problem with that. Some of the ladies in the house might have a problem looking like Jesus too, I'm just saying, right? So that would be a problem as well, but that's really not what he's talking about either. His desire is that we grow and mature and change into the image of his son. Be like Jesus, not what he looks like, but what he is like. Philippians 1, 6, though, here's the reminder again. It's not about what you do to become like Jesus. Philippians 1, 6 says the one who began the good work. Who began the good work? I just told you what it was. Who, who started it? Jesus, salvation is of the Lord, right? It's his salvation. He started that relationship in you, and it says in his word that he will be, the one who began the good work will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus. So whenever, he, whenever you meet him in the clouds and glory, whenever it happens, I don't know when you're all gonna die, but whenever that happens, that process will end. But until then, that same one who started the relationship with you will continue to transform you and sanctify you into the image of his son. You don't have to put on robe. You don't have to put on sandals. He doesn't care what you wear to church. Amen? He just wants you to be like Jesus, right? What does that look like? Okay, anyone? What, I want to be like Jesus. Jesus was like the nicest dude ever, right? I mean, let's just face it. People, like, they, they, they wanted to stone him and kill him, and they ultimately did. But did he ever do anything wrong? The guy was so nice. <clears throat> he was so nice. He, he waited on people. He, he prayed for them. He served them. He healed them. He raised them from the dead. 
He, he washed their feet. He cooked the meals. Like this was the nicest dude ever. This is a character inside of him that, that God's looking for. So when he talks about sanctifying, growing and maturing and, and, and changing, it's not to look like Jesus. We know we can't pull that off, right? It's, it's the one who began a good work in you. See, in. Something's happening inside of you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 will tell us specifically what God is trying to do in you to make you like Jesus. It says that this Holy Spirit that now resides in you will produce these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the ongoing ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the believer. And this is the character of Christ, an increasing display in the life of the authentic follower of Jesus Christ. If you want to know if you're saved, you should be able to look in the rearview mirror of your life and say, am I more gentle now than I was a few years ago? Am I, am I more peaceful now? Do I have greater level of patience? Do I love better than I did before? Has it become a little bit more unconditional than it was before? You love me, I love you. Is that going away? Are you still re playing reciprocating love? Are you offering love freely because Christ is working inside of you? Are you more faithful in all the things? I'm not just saying just be faithful to your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Are you faithful in what you, are you faithful at work? Are you showing up on time? Are you doing your job while you're there? Are you faithful in your serving? Are you faithful in your giving? Are you faithful in the time you spend with your spouse? Are you faithful in everything? In increase, not, not, not perfect, we're not there yet, right? Because it's an ongoing thing, he said. But are you more faithful now than you were last year? We should look at ourselves. And, and Paul tells us to check it. Check it, check it, check it. Ongoing checking all the time. And this is what God is doing. This is the growth and the change that God is doing inside the believer. And so we see again, we have to trust that God will do this in us. Salvation is trusting in what God did. Sanctification is trusting in what God does. So we see in all of this that we've talked about already, and what we also see in our text here tonight is that this rich relationship with God is based solely on trusting him. That's what a, a, an amazing, dynamic relationship looks like with God. I don't know what you think it was supposed to be. I don't know what you thought God's will was for your life. I may have made that crash and burn when I gave you the quote from the scriptures. I don't know what you think faithfulness looks like. I don't know what you think the relationship with God is supposed to look like as a whole. But I can tell you one thing, just showing up on Saturday night, that's not enough. I mean, I mean what would ha what, imagine yourself for a second that you're just God. A lot of us think that we are anyway, so it should be easy, right? I mean, come on. So we just imagine for a second that you're God. Here comes the hammer. So you're God, and, and, and you're up there doing your God thing up in heaven, and you're spinning planets, and you're deciding oxygen levels, and all that kind of stuff that we don't do. And, 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 and your people that you, that you love, and you cherish, that you died for, that the extent of the relationship, even though you want it to be awesome and every day, right, just like you would with a husband and a wife and a boyfriend and a girlfriend and kids, that you just showed up on Saturday night at 6 and just said, Lord, here I am, love you, here's my 10 bucks, gone. Would Wives, right? Is that working? How many, how many single ladies in the house would say, if, if a dude that walked in here right now and said, that's what I'll offer you, how many would sign up for that one? Yeah, I didn't think a lot of hands would go up. What's wrong with you? He's cute. Still not enough. Makes a lot of money. Popular. Nice car. Big house. What's wrong with you? That's what we do. So a lot of people do. 
I'm believing for better things here at our church, and I can see it happening. People spend a lot more time with the Lord. They're at his feet often, a lot, consistently, in his word, in prayer. We had, the, we had the most people here on Monday night for prayer than we've ever had before. That was awesome, right? It was awesome. And, and I just want to encourage you, just keep doing it. You want, listen, don't, I'm, I'm telling you right now, come, listen, I'm one of you. Don't let the lack of people in this room tonight change your commitment to coming in here on Monday night. Don't let the lack of people in this room tonight change your commitment to coming on Wednesday. Don't let the lack of people in here change your commitment to God's church and what he's doing here and in your life. Press in and stand firm for what you believe. He's a, he's a giver of good gifts, and he said he wants to build his church. So don't worry about what you see. Just know what he said and trust in that, okay? Don't, 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 don't fail in that. Just keep with it. Keep with it. <clears throat> It is God's will that you should be sanctified. We're going to become more like Jesus. He's going to do the work in us. We see that salvation is of his, is of the Lord. We see that sanctification is also of the Lord. And, what's, and, and so what do we see here in this text? What we see here is just God just coming to you, and he's just pleading with you to trust him at higher levels. To trust him in all things in life. That's what he's telling you. To. He's, and so he's used this weak messenger to, to, to pass on to you that he is the one who started your relationship on what he did. You need to trust that. He's the one who's continuing the relationship with you and you're growing is all because of him. And so he's calling you knowing that, that you could trust him in all things, not just in those things, but in all these things. That's what he's doing. He's pleading with you. And so how does he do that? How does Jesus go after this thing right now? I, he's like, I want you to trust me in everything. Everything. And some of you probably have something pop into your mind right now that's just like, man, I would love to trust you in this thing, but I just, man, I don't, I, I, uh, man, I don't know if I can do that. And you're just holding on to something. And I don't know what it is, but what does Jesus do here? I think this is genius, of course, which he is. What, how does he go after this thing? He wants us to trust him in everything, so what does he do? He goes after the most important thing to us. And I'm not talking about, you know, don't buy big boats and big houses and opulent things. He doesn't even, he doesn't even talk about those foolish things. He goes after the most important things, food. And drink, like, because if you don't have those things, you can go without opulent homes and live, right? You go without food and water, what happens? You die. So he goes, Jesus, he goes right at the base of this thing, right? Right at the foundation of it, and he goes right after your basic needs. And it's like, you know, if you could trust him with the most important things, then trusting him with all the rest of the stuff should come really easy, right? So he goes after food and clothing and drink, your basic needs, don't even think about that. Now just ponder that for a moment. Don't even think about where you're going to eat your next meal. See, we'll read that and we'll go, wow, he's really, so he's calling us to a high level of trust, but then immediately, as soon as this service is done, you're going to start thinking about where you're going to go eat. And, and, and listen, I'm just as guilty, right? Isn't that what we do? Good, good sermon, preacher. Where are we eating? I mean, that's exactly what's going to happen, right? And I'm not ripping you, but, and we can laugh about it, but it's so very true, right? We, we see what it says, but we don't really want to kind of do it. You know what I mean? But just imagine, if you will, have some vision. Can you imagine what would happen if there was a group of people that actually did what the Bible said? Do you think that God would, 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 would show up in a greater way in this community? I believe that he would. And I don't believe that he calls this radical. I think he calls this ordinary and normal for the believer. Because you see, he's not speaking to Billy Graham here. He's not speaking to, to the famous preachers. He's speaking to his disciples, the fishermen, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the everyday Joes and Joettes. Right? That's who he's talking to. He's like, do this. Don't even think about these things. Don't worry about everyday life. Just think about that. What would we do if we weren't doing that? <laughs> what would we do if we weren't thinking about everyday life? 
Who in this room could ever say that they're not thinking about everyday life? I mean, isn't that what we do every day? Yes. We wake up with a, cha- with a task and a chore, and this is what I'm going to work on. <coughs> this is what I'm going to accomplish. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> she says, don't worry about everyday life. He starts talking about food and clothing and drink. <clears throat> and this is not the gospel, this is just me, but when you start reading that, doesn't food and clothing and drink just sort of become euphemistic for all that we would focus our resources on, on gathering and gaining to ourselves to gain some sense of joy and security and purpose? I think so. And I would say that Jesus would tell you that your life is so much more than that. I would say that Jesus would say that I didn't create you for just that. I created you for more than just to to work super hard and to gather some stuff and then to pay for it and die. And tragically, that's the extent of a lot of people's lives. What was the main purpose of your today? It's a good question, right? I mean, you all woke up this morning, I think. And when you, when you woke up this morning, did you have a plan? I mean, I knew what my plan was, this, you know. <clears throat> but you had a plan, right? And, and that plan would really, if you think about it, that would identify your purpose for that day. So here's a day that you didn't create. Here's air in your lungs that you did not create. And you're a, a passive participant in this thing called today. And you woke up and you decided what you're going to do with your day today. And that's an important question because even though today is just bleep, but today becomes tomorrow, and tomorrow becomes a week, and a week becomes a month, and a month, a year, and a decade, and a lifetime, and it starts with today. What was your purpose today when you woke up? What what did you set out to accomplish with the day that God gave you today? And Jesus is challenging that. He's the one who's asking, not me, because he's saying, don't worry about everyday life. He's saying, don't think about these things that you normally spend all your mental resources on. How much of it is being spent on me and my kingdom, not yours? Ask the question. Don't just blow it off. Think about, go back for a second and press rewind on your day and think about when you woke up this morning. What did you set out to do? And listen, whatever it was, I, it, it's not like it's, I think you washed your wheels today, right? Anything wrong with that? Nothing. Is there anything wrong with washing his wheels? Nothing, right? Play guitar. So there was some stuff. What would you do today, Mike? Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, there's one in every crowd. It's the hairdo, brothers. It's the hairdo. Yes. <clears throat> Brotherly love, man. <clears throat> what was your purpose today? Making cookies. You can make cookies to the glory of God. Okay. You could do that. And there's lots of things that we could do. But he's like, I know what you need, man. I'll take care of that. I'm not just like these amazing stories in the Bible that we go, ooh, ah, like, wow. It's not in there to get a ooh, ah. He don't care about your ooh, ah. <laughs> you know, he doesn't need your applause. Truth be known, preachers like when you applaud because even though it's for the Lord, you, we get a sense of accomplishment when you applaud. But God doesn't need that. 
God doesn't need your applause. He wants your obedience. That's what he wants. Don't clap for me, man. Do for me. Don't clap. And so God's like, I got your needs. And he says, let me tell you why you should trust me. And he uses two examples in the text that we read. The first one, this is so cool. Look at the raven. He says, look at the raven. Of all the things he could have chose, right? He chose a common blackbird. Lame, right? I don't see it. Yeah. That's what he chose. And, 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 and Jesus, right? Jesus, of all the things he created, he could have chose anything right then and there, right? If he takes care of everything, he, he could have put anything up there. But he, he chose the raven. I think that's so cool. You know, the raven, like you guys may already know this, but like that bird right there, that, that doesn't represent good things. Right? The, the raven, in, in some Western traditions, ravens have been considered to be birds of, of ill omen. Like, if you see one, that's like a bad deal. Like, something bad's coming. The, here comes the grim reaper. It's going to be bad. Uh, it's a sign of death and evil. In Sweden, listen to this. In Sweden, I did a little research on ravens. I don't know what you guys did this week. This is what I did. Right? <laughs> in Sweden, ravens are known as the ghosts of murdered people. In Germany, they're the, they're the souls of the damned. In, 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 in lots of uh, old ancient Danish folklore, it, it talks of this creature called the Val Raven. The Val Raven w- would eat a king's heart and they would gain human knowledge and perform great malicious acts and lead people astray and have superhuman powers. And then it was known to go out on the battlefield and eat the bodies of the dead soldiers. That was the Val Raven, right? The bottom line is this, that the, that the raven, the blackbird, is not prized. It's not adored by anyone. It never represents anything good, and it's not beautiful. No one's going on the, down the road in their car and seeing a, a blackbird killed on the side of the road, and they're starting to like a, a blackbird protection society. Right. Nobody's doing that, right? Like, who even cares about the blackbird? Like kitties, that's cool. Stop for turtles, right? We all do that because they're cute, right? But a blackbird, no one cares about a blackbird. If anything, they're evil and ugly, right? And Jesus uses that creature to describe how much he cares for you. He says, if, 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 if I'll even, listen, he's not a bald eagle, like bald we have bald eagles all around our house. Anyone have bald eagles around that? They're, they're, they're majestic and they're powerful and, you know, national bird and they're protected, right? You can't touch these things. They're, they're prized possessions of our country and they're tremendous and powerful and the wingspan is huge and they're gorgeous animals, right? He could have used that, but he didn't. This past week, we were, Meredith and I were walking back from the little recreation center in our community and she's like, honey, check this out. And I look up, and above the house was that. And I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen one like this before. It's a swallow tail kite. But it was gore- it, it much like, you guys see an eagle when it's way up in the, in, in the hu- high up in the currents, and they just like this, and they don't move, and they're just soaring along, right? And it's like gorgeous. This one was kind of doing the same thing, but like 30 feet from the ground. Just above our roof lines is this big, awesome bird of prey with gorgeous colors, and he's just soaring. He's not moving, and he's just slicing through the wind, and all of a sudden, wings back, and right down behind the house, he was diving for something. I've never seen anything like that before. It was gorgeous, gorgeous bird. Jesus didn't use that as an example. Like, if he was a beautiful animal like that, you'd be like, oh, okay, I get it. I did a little research more, not just on the raven and what it represents in Sweden, but I looked at some more beautiful birds that Jesus could have used as an example. If he took care of this stuff that we prize, then maybe he'll take. So did you guys ever hear of a golden pheasant? Absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. Look at that. It looks fake almost, doesn't it? It's so beautiful. Look at the colors. Look at the details of this bird. 
just absolutely gorgeous. Well, obviously the Lord would take care of this, but it wasn't an eagle and it wasn't the swallowtail kite and it wasn't the golden pheasant. It was none of those things. It was the raven. And even the raven, God says, I provide for its needs. And so how much more, if I would provide for that thing that represents evil and simplicity and common and nothing of value to anybody, if I would take care of that thing, how much more would I take care of the one thing in creation that's known as the Imago Dei, created in my image to be like me? God's word says that of all the things he created, you, my brothers and sisters, are his masterpiece. If he would take care of this and all of its needs, how much more so would he take care of you and your needs? Aren't you more valuable than that? Jesus uses another example. You see it there in verse 27. Not just the raven. He's talking about the lilies in the field and the flowers. This is the flowers grow and they live. And God takes care of them as well. We read about the, the flowers there in the field when we read through it. Look at the lilies and how they grow. They, they don't work or make their clothing. But he says, well, let's, let's build some value into the flower for a second. He said that they're more beautiful than King Solomon's rich flowing robes and, and his opulent attire that we might not lust after now because it's a little different now than it was back then. We might look at somebody else's fashions and, and kind of lust and, and want those things. We wouldn't want maybe King Solomon's stuff. But that was the height of wealth. That was the height of prosperity. That was the, the height of opulence. He had what all of us would want. And it was beautiful. Think of the richest man who ever lived, who who's, gave his life to building palaces and gardens and all the nicest stuff anyone could ever have. He said he withheld from himself no good pleasure. Every single thing a man could want, he had. All the things that we would work frantically for all the time, not so much trusting in God to provide our needs, but I want this and I want that. We work like crazy. Solomon had it. And it says here, these flowers, they're more beautiful than even Solomon and all of his beautiful garb that he had. But again, the Lord says, if I'll take care of the flowers, then you can trust that I'll take care of you. He, he says, if, you, if I'll take care of the flowers, not just take care of them so that they'll grow, but if I'll take care of them and dress them in such detail, not just, not just there in the field, right? But look at the, did you ever look at the details of a flower? Did you ever stop and just look inside and see the, the intricate, beautiful, amazing details that no human artist could ever make? Kind of like the feathers on that bird. Like, wow. Did you ever do that? He says, I, I did that with them, but yet, these flowers, they're there today and they're thrown in the fire tomorrow. Like They're that meaningless and insignificant, but yet I'll do that. Do you ever do a, I've been to a, a, a bonfire over at the, the De Giacomo's when they, everyone's over and they put the, the Christmas tree in the fire. You know, and we spend all those, the, like a month or so, we, we get this tree, right? And we spend all kinds of money and we decorate it like crazy and it's like the centerpiece of our house for like, a month and a half, and it's gorgeous, and then we put it in the bonfire. Did you ever see a Christmas tree burn in the, in the bonfire? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> All that. One month. 200 bucks. Centerpiece of my Gone. That's what he's talking about. He's like, th this thing that I would decorate and, and care for with such detail, but it's here today and it's gone tomorrow. If I'll do that for that thing, won't you trust me with your life? Yes. And that's why he says, why do you have such little faith? Why don't you trust that I'll do this? Have I not proven myself to you? Have I not blessed you in ways you can't describe? Have I not been faithful to you all the days of your life? Was I not there when you needed me? When you called to me for salvation, didn't I run into your arms? I was there, right? So, so if he's done that, why? 
Why will you not trust him with the details of your life? Trust me, says the Lord. Trust my promises. You know, if you pick up the scriptures and, and spend any time in God's word, which I hope that you will do, you spend time reading his word and you're gonna see that, the, that this whole thing about trust is running constantly and consistently through God's word. And, and this idea of trust is the basis of this rich relationship that God wants with you. Now, I would hope that at this point that you would say, well, if you're a preacher of any value at all, you wouldn't just say that, but you'd give me some Bible to back that up. Anyone? I want, I want you to ask me. How about Jeremiah 17.7? 7? Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Psalm 56, 3, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Psalm 143, 8, show me the way to go, for to you I entrust my life. Psalm 91, 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. God would say to you today, trust me. That's it. That's the simple message from God. It says in his word that he knows everything that you need. Over in verse 31, he says, he knows all that you need. And so seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you need will be given to you. What does he mean by this? He says, don't worry about your earthly needs. Just pursue me wholeheartedly. Pursue a relationship with me so that, that trust can be built inside of you, young man or, or young woman, son or daughter of God. Trust in me. Let the trust grow inside of me. Se seek the kingdom in you first. Go after me with your whole heart so I can build my kingdom in you. And then go after me and my purposes with all your heart so I can build the kingdom of God out there as well. That's what he wants from you. And if you'll do that, he says he'll take care of all, say it, all your needs. How would God show how amazing he really is if you would not give him an opportunity to prove this? How, how, how will you ever grow to trust in him in the mysterious unknown things if you won't give him the opportunity to prove himself in the clearly defined promises of scripture? He says right here, if you will put my kingdom first, I will take care of all your needs. You will lack nothing if you come after me. <clears throat> there needs to be a priority shift in our life. And I will preach from this pulpit till I'm dead for this and I'll never stop. Never. Never enough, always more, not gonna, to increase his love for you, but to increase the, your trust in him to increase your, 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 your usefulness in his kingdom to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth if you will trust in him more. <clears throat> I want to dwell on, on uh, one last thing before we wrap up. I, th I thought this was really cool. And I think it'll encourage you. It encouraged me. Who likes the beach? You were just there, and you posted some pictures of the beach, which was really pretty. If you're into that sort of thing, I'm, I'm more of a mountain guy, but, you know, I, beach is nice. Do you, uh, yeah, I know, right? Do you ever stand on the seashore, just look? When you stand there, what do, you, what do you feel? What do you feel about yourself? Very, very small. How does it make you feel to know that, anyone have any big problems? Big problems? Anyone feel as though they're a pretty, um, 
resourceful man or a woman and kind of get some things done? I think I kind of am, right? So we've got some big problems. We've got some big talents and abilities too. When you stand at the beach, though, you feel very, very small. How does it make you feel to know that you can fit a million earths in the little sun? How do you feel now? Very, very small. <clears throat> Feeling small can be pretty scary. When you stand in front of that ocean, you look, or you think about the fact that this humongous earth with seven billion people, that you could fit a million of these into the sun. And all of a sudden you start realizing just how small you are. You start feeling, I can only do so much, <laughs> you know. I start sensing my limitations if you stand there at the ocean. Who is this God that you should trust him? Pharaoh asked that. Who is this, sh this God that I should believe in him? And we might ask that too. Who is this God that I should trust him? <laughs> He's the God that can look at two and a half billion of us in the church and call us a little flock. You think you're so big. You think your problem is so big. You think your abilities are so grand. He sits on his throne in heaven with that, just that little bit of sarcasm. We, I talked to Dan about it yesterday. That little bit of condescension and sarcasm. And he says, listen, little flock, I got this. You and I are a little flock compared to the one who, who split the Red Sea at his word. You and I are a very, very little flock to the God who spoke and the universe and the details on the golden pheasant were created at his word. That's how little we are. We are his little flock. And being little can be very, very scary, but for the Christ follower, it doesn't have to be scary. Worship band, come on, come on. Let's, let's sing some songs to Jesus. But being small doesn't need to be scary. And being small doesn't need to, to make you feel insignificant when you read the rest of the verse. See, when we stand at the ocean, we say, man, I'm so small. And, we're, and you called us a little flock. We're, we're kind of little. But when you read the rest of the verse, it's encouraging because it says, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives our Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. You see? This is humongous. This is, people talk about the majors of our faith being salvation issues. I tend to disagree. What I think the majors of our faith are, are the nature and character of God himself. That's massive. And what the scriptures tell us clearly right here, that it is in his nature to want to give you this help that we speak of tonight. He, it, listen, he loves you, right? So he sends you his son. And so he does these things because he loves you. But listen, listen, you gotta get this because God is completely about God. He does these things. He takes care of your needs because it makes him happy to do so. What, listen, you're smart people. Why would he withhold these things if giving it makes him happy? Why would he want to deprive himself of joy and pleasure and happiness by withholding these things from us? And some of us, we talked about today, some of us come and we beg and plead, Lord, would you please help me? Would you please help me? It's pathetic. He wants to help you. Yes. He wants to give you the help. He wants to care for your needs. It makes him happy to do so. You don't have to beg and you don't have to earn it. You don't have to wonder or doubt because it gives God pleasure and happiness to give you the care we speak of tonight.
He knows everything you need and he's sitting right now on his throne in heaven with his hands filled with all the care that you need, all the blessings you desire and he wants to give them to you because it makes him happy to do this. That's the God who saved you. That's the God who's changing you. That's the one who's preparing a place for you. This is the God that we serve in this church. That's the real God, the God of the Bible. And that, that trust in Him, that's the rich relationship that God desires to have with each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and then we're going to worship the Lord. Lord, I thank you for your, for your very nature. I thank you, Lord, that it brings you great joy to give us the kingdom, to take care of our very needs. Lord, I thank you that you use the examples that you did because you, you care for the low things. And so how much more would you care for your masterpiece of all creation? The one thing that you said you created in your image to be like you. I just ha had this thought as I said that, Lord, if it gives you great happiness for us to be provided for and you want us to be like you, then you want us to be happy. You want us to be happy in our relationship with you. So, so, so Lord, I, I thank you for that. Lord, I, I thank you for the details of the golden pheasant. I thank you for the, for, the, for the details of the lilies of the field. And Lord, if you care for those things so much, in such detail, how much more so would you take care of us? Thank you for for exposing your nature before us so that we could have faith in you, trust in you. Lord, I pray that you help our trust in you to grow yes. in all things. Before we launch out into tomorrow, Lord, when we're in our bed tomorrow morning, before we start our day, would you remind us to think about our purpose for Sunday? What is it that we're to do with our day? How would we bring you the most glory, Lord, with our day that you've given us? How would we bring you the most glory with the body that you gave us? How would, yes. how would we bring you the most glory with the mouth that you gave us? How would, you, how would we bring you the most glory with the job that you gave us, with the roles that you've given us? How would we bring you the most glory, Lord? Help us to, to, remind it of, to be reminded of that question. But we truly want to see you show up in our church and do insane things. And we want to be able to be those people that change the world. But we need to trust you more, Lord. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.